pursuant to the provisions of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for a review under a common law writ of cert. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. Um, we do have quorum. I am going to switch my chair remarks until after our guest is able to speak so we don't um, keep him longer than he needs to be here. Um, so if Mr. Hoffer, am I pronouncing that correctly? Can you hear me? Hofer. Hofer. Um, we can go ahead and get started. Um, we're just waiting a little bit to get the your slides on our screens, but some of us have them up already, or once you show them. As a quick introduction, while the screens are getting set up, I just wanted to um, uh, tell the board a little background. Uh, as we were setting up the panel for last month's meeting, we had reached out to some national experts um, around uh, license plate readers, and uh, Mr. Hofer um, was not able to make the last meeting, but said he would be able to make this month's meeting. And, and, and so to continue the conversation, um, we uh, decided that to bring him uh, to this meeting, as well as uh, to have to continue the conversation with the board. Um, Mr. Hofer is the chair of the Oakland Privacy Commission and uh, does work in around uh, the oversight of surveillance technologies. And so we thought his perspective was particularly important for the community oversight board as the legislation would have this body doing oversight of uh, license plate reader programs um, in each legislation. So we thought this would be an important conversation uh, to have around uh, how uh, the models of oversight and um, what oversight can look like in practice. And if we're ready to go, Great. Yeah, so thank you for this opportunity. My name is Brian Hofer. Um, as you just heard, from the City of Oakland's Privacy Commission. I've been the only chair since we were formed in March of 2016. Uh, after I got uh, a few years under my belt, uh, I formed uh, Secure Justice, which is a nonprofit also located in Oakland, uh, but we now work all across the country uh, advising uh, anybody that wants help, we work with law enforcement, municipal staff, administrative folks, uh, both on the law enforcement and smart city end. Uh, we work with community advocates and, and just any concerned citizen that would like to learn how to uh, try to thread the needle to distinguish between appropriate and inappropriate uses of technology, uh, which, is, you know, is a, a never ending path. Um, I'm going to give you a quick little overview of just sort of how this started out and, and run through our, our uh, framework and try to give you, you know, some real world applicability here. Um, I was not an activist uh, in, a, in June of 2013. Edward Snowden hit the front pages, uh, really, you know, pulled back the covers on what a lot of the intelligence agencies had been doing. And two weeks later, Oakland publicly revealed a citywide mass surveillance uh, proposal. Um, we call it the Domain Awareness Center. Today, it's usually called the Real-Time Crime Center. Uh, as you can see from these uh, various images on your screen, uh, it would aggregate the data collected from many surveillance technology systems, license plate readers, cameras, and so on. Uh, it would be shared with many partners, federal, state, and local. And in the political climate that we had at that time, it obviously caused a lot of concern in no small part because Oakland had zero privacy policies for any of this surveillance technology. We had no guardrails in place. Uh, you know, we had our typical sort of Oakland flavor as we protested this. Uh, Occupy Oakland had just ended, so there was a lot of, um, you know, energy in, in, the, in the building. And 
some of this was could accurately be described as, you know, the cover up was worse than the crime. And I've seen this in many jurisdictions I've worked with. Seattle acquired drones in secret and then it blew up in their face. Uh, Los Angeles was using social media software to target activists. They never went through the system. Um, they didn't inform folks of what they were doing, and that led to a lot of negative consequences, which I hope we can help you um, uh, mitigate. As a result of that uh, opposition, they created first an ad hoc temporary commission, which I eventually ended up chairing, and then we uh, convinced the city to turn it into a permanent body because we quickly recognized that this was not going to be a one-time need. We were going to constantly have to evaluate technology as it came in, especially in Oakland where um, we don't always have the resources like a San Francisco or some of our rich neighbors. Uh, we rely on technology more than perhaps others um, to uh, attempt to address public safety concerns. What our oversight body does, and, and I do understand, I've been informed that you folks have uh, made some significant progress and that there are actual written proposals in front of you. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you how ours works. We're an advisory body. We do not retain ultimate authority on anything the city council does. Uh, we are comprised of subject matter experts. We have hardware, or software, network technologists. We have community organizers. We have a former OPD law enforcement officer. Um, some civil liberties, uh, immigration rights attorneys. So we have a collective body of expertise, and obviously we do some of our own research as well if we don't know the answer. Um, but we vet what staff brings to us. Any department, not just the police department, uh, up front, um, we require an impact analysis. Highlight the red or potential yellow flags, and ideally your use policy that you're bringing forth at the same time uh, would mitigate those concerns. Uh, for example, and I, I know license plate readers uh, are in front of you folks, and as they are in many jurisdictions right now, uh, if, if the primary concern around license plate readers is data retention and the ability to mine and profile folks, one practical step to mitigate that is a shortened retention period. The less data points you have, the less uh, of an ability to identify folks. We also comment on legislation at, at the state and federal level that might impact Oakland. Uh, there is an ongoing annual reporting obligation for each piece of uh, covered technology. Uh, we don't want to approve it and forget it up front. You know, is it working? Did it achieve the stated goals? Uh, mission creep is always a concern. Uh, we have Stingray cell phone trackers here in Oakland, uh, which was very controversial when it was introduced, but we found a way to say, okay, you know, we certainly understand the need to go use this in a homicide investigation, but you shouldn't use it for petty theft, for example, uh, because it's just too invasive, too powerful of a, of a tool um, for, for a, a lesser crime. And that's where we sort of drew the lines on those. They have to come back every year and tell us, you know, has this stuff worked? What this framework really did, and, and you know, what I understand you guys are really trying to accomplish as well, is that it was a public vetting process. You give the, the public for the first time a real meaningful bite of the apple. Um, historically, um, there's been very short notice provisions. In California, under the Brown Act, you have 72 hours. People post things on a Friday, and we all vote on Tuesday at city, county, and state level. You can't organize. You can't educate over the weekend. You're not going to get access to your elected officials and the administrative staff. Um, and it's really hard to raise awareness. And so we have lengthier notice provisions. Uh, we have a reviewing body, the Privacy Commission, you know, for you folks, could be your civilian oversight board. Uh, other jurisdictions have used the Police Commission. But it gives the public uh, a, a real opportunity to weigh in and say, you know, this makes us uncomfortable or we do approve of this. And then together with staff, and I do want to emphasize, it doesn't exclude, you know, any staff, including the police, but it does include the, the public for the first time really in the policy making. Typically, the police especially, they just unilaterally write a set of rules and publicly produce it at the last minute, and the city council generally rubber stamps it. And we've seen some problems arise in that type of scenario. Our definition of surveillance technology, as you can see on the screen, is very broad, future-proof, uh, on purpose. Um, in case you're worried that that would capture almost any technological device, yes, that's true. Uh, pretty much any, you know, most devices, especially with Wi-Fi or 
you know, any of these sensors now could be used uh, with some work to identify folks. But of course, there are things that are pretty benign where that risk is remote. And so we specifically uh, exclude those categories. You know, we didn't want to touch the definition, but we did want to exclude certain categories of, um, you know, technology where the concern is so remote that it's not worth the administrative uh, burden. So this takes a lot of your disparate uh, procurement practices. It puts them all into one framework. You come forward, you present your idea, you uh, discuss the potential impacts, both good and bad, right? Is there a track record in other entities? You know, has this worked elsewhere? How much did it cost? Cost overruns are a big concern in this space. We see people that have the upfront money, but not for the ongoing cost, uh, ongoing costs, and that leads to further problems as well. Here's how the sequence works. Staff would notify, in this case, me, I'm the chair. Uh, I put them on the agenda and the upfront reviews of the impact report and use policy. Uh, we work with staff. Uh, almost always, we've reached agreement before we get to the city council. We've had a couple disagreements, but in four years, I mean, I literally mean a couple disagreements. Um, once we've been able to educate staff, they've been pretty responsive. Uh, we recommend a, an adopt or reject or, or possibly modify the use policy if we're in disagreement and that goes forward to the city council. Um, again, we have increased uh, notice provisions so that the public can really see. And then the city council has to make a determination. Are the likely benefits from this proposal going to outweigh the costs? And the costs are both the civil liberties and the taxpayer. Some technology, the efficacy is really in serious doubt right now. And, and you know, coming out of a COVID recession and just some jurisdictions don't have resources, uh, we do want to be mindful to protect the taxpayer as well. Um, we've worked on proposals, you know, for drones, um, uh, you know, illegal dumping, cell site simulators, GPS trackers, uh, shot spotter, gunshot detecting technology, all sorts of smart city applications for like traffic congestion and, uh, you know, parking asset management, mobility, dockless scooters, and other sharing things, and, and really the whole uh, uh, technological innovation coming out of Silicon Valley is ending up in front of us at some point. This is the meat of, of the upfront um, vetting. These are the categories. Um, you know, obviously, I've simple, simplified these, these into just a heading. Uh, but we want to know, you know, what are you going to capture? What are your proposed specific uses? You know, the old days, the, the use was any law enforcement purpose. You know, that, that was just too broad. It, it didn't say, you know, really what you're going to use it for. We want to an analyze, you know, is this going to potentially have a negative impact on civil rights, uh, civil liberties? You know, facial recognition is uh, misidentifying, you know, black women at 35% higher rate than uh, white men. You know, that needs to be discussed or predictive analytics are, are you, you know, using historically, you know, racially biased data, that's going to give us a bad output on the other end. How do we mitigate that? As I mentioned earlier, you know, if license plate reader data being collected, uh, aggregated, it is really is the concern, well, then you shorten your retention period. Uh, third party access is always a big part that we look at. Uh, California itself is a sanctuary state. Oakland has been a sanctuary city for a long time. We don't want ICE coming in and getting our data. So we put, you know, sometimes prohibitions. Uh, we generally always have some sort of restriction. Uh, we call it a, a, a right to know and a need to know. You know, if you're a foreign officer, you might have the right to know, but are you actually involved in this investigation or are you just going on a fishing expedition? And so the are uh, things we look for. Also just discuss, you know, is there a better alternative? Maybe the old way of, uh, you know, manual uh, police officer walking around without technology was actually more effective than, you know, whatever new widget Silicon Valley is uh, proposing to us. And as I mentioned, it, you, you, under our model, you essentially get approval every, for on a one-year basis. Uh, you have to meet that standard that the benefits outweigh the costs, and that gives you one year you come back again. Um, I do imagine, and there has been some discussions, especially for like lower volume technology where there just isn't much to report, you know, people might lengthen that to, you know, a reporting period of, you know, every two to three years uh, because the burden just hasn't really been worth uh, the extra scrutiny there. 
but we want to know. And this is a summary, you know, whenever I walk into a new jurisdiction, law enforcement, you know, kind of fears that the sky is going to fall, that we're going to reveal, you know, any active investigations. And, and, and that's not the case at all under our model. Uh, this is a summary of information. It's aggregate data. You know, uh, did you send five license plate reader scans to the district attorney for prosecution? Uh, how many body camera uh, video clips? You know, that's all automated at this point. Um, so you can, you can get those numbers without too much of a burden. Uh, we want to look for disparate impact. Are you only policing a certain neighborhood? Why? Um, have there been community complaints? Um, efficacy is a big one. You know, are we getting our money's worth? Uh, did we go over budget? I don't know if you saw the San Diego uh, smart street lights in the news. They got quite a bit of press. They were promised savings of three to four million dollars a year due to better efficiencies, and they were going to have all sorts of sensors that would help their smart city and sustainability folks plan. You know, traffic congestion and pedestrian safety, and so on. You know, weather metrics. The sensors didn't work, and instead of saving millions of dollars, they ended up costing four hundred thousand dollars more than they'd spent the year before because the tech wasn't uh, efficient either. So those are the types of things, and they didn't. They didn't Cost. So it, it blew up in their face and they got into a contract fight with their vendor. And it's because we didn't ask any of those questions up front. Uh, so this this model, the reason I really believe it's it's you know very elegant and appropriate for any jurisdiction, and it's been done in uh, cities and counties uh, over 23 across the country. There are attempts, and we are attempting here in California to do it at the state level. But it's it's really just good, you know, government. Uh, you vet these things, you do a cost-benefit analysis. It's something we should be doing on, uh, you know, I would think most uh, taxpayer-funded proposals uh, where the city council is, you know, both the policy-setting body and, and the resource allocator. We also look at technical mitigations. Um, this probably isn't sharp enough on your end uh, via WebEx to see, but the photo on the left is unobscured and the photo on the right is blurred. So we've been able to use controversial technology systems and with our subject matter expertise and the technologists that we have, we've been able to say, you know, we can mitigate the harm from this and still get, you know, efficacy uh, where we need it, you know, for real crime fighting or, or other smart city applications. So I'll go ahead and leave it there. So, you know, in a, in a, in a nutshell, that's how the framework um, is designed. You know, I, I can tell you now that we've had a, a, a few years under our, our model that there's definitely been some bumps and bruises. Um, there's some blood holding early on, but the administrative burden, uh, the concerns have been vastly overstated. We have not seen significant budget increase or requests for more staff. A couple here and there, but not, not statistically significant. Uh, one of the bigger problems which arose in Oakland recently was that our police department had falsified a bunch of the statistics over license plate readers. And despite telling us repeatedly in writing that they had conducted audits, uh, they hadn't ever, never once. And so that, you know, became a, a pretty big point of contention. And my nonprofit, Secure Justice, we're doing a, an analysis of these frameworks here in the Bay Area. We have seven at the moment. There's more on the way. Uh, but we started to try to identify ways to refine the model. And one of the improvements that we're recommending is an inspector general. I've been informed that your civilian oversight board may already have some of this authority that my privacy commission does not. Uh, but we really need someone examine the raw data to the extent possible. And of course, there could be state and federal laws that impact that, but somebody has to be able to tell us that the data we're receiving is accurate. Um, right now, the weakness in this model is that we have to accept things at face value. And it is unfortunate, but you know, sometimes people lie um, or overstate the success. Um, and so we, that's one of the in my opinion, it's a low-hanging fruit. It's not very expensive to go get an inspector general. But for someone that could say, yes, the data in this annual report is accurate. And then the whole primary goal of this framework is to have better informed decision making. You know, that way both the, the reviewing body and, and the ultimate authority of the city council can, can make a, a, a truly informed decision. 
They're going to have a robust reporting metrics into them. They're going to have the cost information. You know, are you reflecting the public treasury uh, appropriately? And uh, you know, are those numbers true? Uh, so, I, you know, despite the little bumps and bruises, I think this model is the most practical. Uh, it's very elegant. It addresses um, technology no matter what the source of funding or just sharing, you know, whether it's a grant, whether it's donated by a private party, private foundations, um, whether we are, it's already existing or it's, you know, proposed to be newly acquired, our ordinance covers all of it. And um, it, there have been really, really amazing uh, results under this. Um, some of the other jurisdictions I work with, you know, uh, we have a transit district out here, BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit District. They're my shining star across all departments. I've worked with over, I think, nine different departments at far. Uh, each one of them, I mean, they, they just bought in. Uh, they understand the concerns. They have the technical expertise to mitigate it. They have some very sophisticated folks. And that is one final plug I want to make uh, before I pause for any questions um, or close my comments here, is that you know these oversight frameworks, if you don't have a reviewing body of subject matter experts, you're really not solving any of the problems. Um, these ordinances without a reviewing body have been tried, including here in California, and the same problems continue to exist. City council members don't suddenly have more capacity because you enacted an ordinance. They certainly don't acquire subject matter expertise just because you put in a framework. So to have a civilian oversight board, first off, it does give the impression, and I do think it's actually true, that it's a more democratic process, that the public has more opportunities for meaningful input. But also, it's just the sim simple matter is that the administrative burden could be significant if you don't have subject matter experts that understand what they're looking at and that could advise you on certain things so that you don't get a lawsuit later or just frustration when these things don't work. Uh, having folks in a room that understand what they're looking at uh, is really critical uh, to making this framework work. So uh, you know, I, I hope that sheds a little light on what we're here doing here in the Bay Area and uh, happy to answer any uh, questions or you know, continue the conversation offline if, if needed. Thank you, Mr. Hopper. Are there any questions? Mr. Kamaguch. A oh, real quick question. Um, can you talk about CCOPs? Do, do you all have any of those in Oakland? And can you, like, explain what they are? Yeah. Um, I didn't mention it up front, but what I just described to you is CCOPS. The ACLU model, uh, the acronym is Community Control Over Policing uh, Surveillance. And although it says police in the title, uh, the model applies to all city departments uh, everywhere that it's been enacted so far. Um, so what I just showed you with like the upfront impact analysis and proposed use policy, the ongoing annual report, uh, that is the ACLU CCOPS model. Where Oakland is different and the subsequent jurisdictions like San Francisco and others have now followed is that we realize that you have to have a vetting body in the middle of the framework. Otherwise, you, you just keep repeating the same mistakes um, that we've done historically. Any other questions? Mr. Hayes. I may have missed that, but uh, how did your agency become uh, established? Uh, was it established by council through ordinance? Correct, yes. Um, our surveillance technology ordinance is a separate document from the Privacy uh, Commission of Formation. Uh, they were established at the same time, but two different ordinances. And uh, happy to forward our enabling uh, legislation, you know, if that would be helpful to you. Uh, we do not demand certain skill sets, but it is certainly suggested and it's just played out that way. Uh, we mentioned a number of different categories where it would be helpful to have expertise. And um, politically, that's just how it has played out. Folks with, with those uh, requisite skill sets have uh, been appointed. Okay, one other question. Uh uh, who do you report to in, within the city? Uh, we take direction from both the council and the city manager, but we uh, serve the city council. We are an advisory body solely to the city council. 
Thank you. Mr. Kamaguchi. Yeah, with that being said, um, has there been any attempts to roll back any of the ordinances or oversight that you currently have in place over the digital surveillance equipment? Yes. Um, none have occurred or even been formally presented. Uh, in the last week, I've been on TV about 25 times. Um, uh, without going too far off on a tangent, um, there's been a lot of falsification of crime statistics here in California and specifically the Bay Area. You've probably seen some of the, the viral videos about, you know, retail theft and smash and grab uh, activity. And I can tell you that, you know, those are single digit occurrences and there's, you know, actually probably only five or six uh, of those events that have actually happened. But that media narrative has led to a lot of Bay Area mayors specifically um, attempting to, if not actually get around the ordinance, you know, violate the spirit of the ordinance by pre-authorizing uh, certain technologies that haven't been vetted. And so we're trying to redirect that energy to say, look, we understand that you need to reallocate resources at times. Of course you do. And of course we all want to, you know, address violent crimes and other crimes, but, you know, that doesn't mean you need to abandon uh, the vetting process. Our ordinance do contain an exigent circumstances provision. So if there's an imminent threat to somebody's life, you know, we understand it's not, you're not going to have time to vet a vendor, enter into a contract, go to the city council for approval. We understand that. So we do build in the freedom to act in an emergency. Um, but in a non-emergent situation, you know, we, we've seen no legitimate reason to abandon this vetting process because it is working. Director Fitchard. Hi, Mr. Hopper. Thank you for being here with us. I have a few questions about your operation specifically. Um, the first question is, like, how many employees do you have? Um, I know that you talked about hiring subject matter experts. And then a little bit about how your budget works. Yes. So, unfortunately, I'll be the worst person to ask that specific as to Oakland. Uh, we're all volunteers, and we have no funding. Um, our police commission is different in that regard, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we can start to get funding. Um, Santa Clara County has a chief privacy officer. They operate under this model. Uh, they do not have a privacy commission, but the CPO does have a staff of four. Um, I hope my memory is accurate. They were about $2 million budget. Uh, Seattle has a, a much larger team and a CPO, and they do have a civilian advisory technology group, not quite like the Privacy Commission. It's kind of like the junior varsity version of it. Uh, their budget is around $4 million. San Francisco has not had to increase their budget. Uh, they went a different unique route. The, uh, their vetting body, uh, the acronym is COIT, C-O-I-T, Committee on Information Technology, uh, they were already city employees. Uh, they are department staffers from a number of different uh, departments, the city administrator's office, uh, city attorney as well. Uh, they have one member serve on this committee. They do the vetting, and since their salaries were already budgeted and allocated, uh, they haven't had to increase. Um, so in a, you know, if in a jurisdiction where resources might be at issue, uh, we try to look for an existing body that could maybe uh, fill that function. Oakland, kind of primarily, uh, not trying to make this about me, but kind of relies on me uh, because I do this for a living uh, via my nonprofit, Secure Justice. Um, so I often carry a lot of the burden in, in writing and just doing the research, but uh, we are trying to make that a city-funded function. Any other questions? If not, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Alper. Great. Thank you for that opportunity. Appreciate it. Um, Dr. Valier, let's uh, move straight into the board position discussion. All right. Thank you. Um, so at, over the last several, last year, um, we've been having conversations around um, 
different aspects of regulation around license plate readers. We've had a lot of discussions, and so um, in discussion with Director Fitchard and uh, the executive committee, um, we tried to uh, come up with a, a potential position statement that's trying to bring in many perspectives. And so uh, what we wanted to do was try to ha is to um, offer a space for discussion, whether there's a um, an area of for a position statement for the board, if that's something the board feels that is important um, for the board to take. Uh, we, in the statement that, that we emailed out, the draft statement, we tried to um, focus on the areas where there, there are differences of opinion in the board. So making one specific position statement is not really, um, wouldn't encapsulate all of the diverse opinions of the board. Um, but really acknowledging that there is a there is a split in our in a, both in our community, and there are there are differences in perspectives where there's you know when we go to the hearings we hear from community members that they don't want any use of license plate readers, or uh, we've also heard that people want restricted use or um, a, a strong regulatory process and. You know, I, and I've heard those sentiments from board members as well that, you know, there may be um, some uses that would be helpful for public safety. And uh, as long as there is that regulation in place in order to um, reduce some of the potential um, harms that we've heard about from uh, some experts in the field um, and really maximize those benefits while minimizing any potential risks. Uh, so, you know, in this, in, in the draft that uh, we sent last week, uh, we tried to sort of take that, um, take that and take some of the points that have been discussed, as well as bring in um, some of the information from the CCOPS model um, that is not currently in any of the legislation, uh, uh, particularly around the uses of other surveillance technologies, having publicly available policies. Um, and then any new technology requiring approval of the Metro Council in a public hearing. So if there is any discussion from the board or any thoughts on uh, you know, potential directions, this we wanted to open the space for a potential you know, for, for discussion. So if I'm if I read it correctly, it's not taking a position, but saying that if council is going forward with this, then the regulations in eight forty one are more consistent with the listed regulations than they are in nine sixty one. That's correct. And this can also be, this is open for revisions from the board members or, um, you know, this is not, this is a draft form to sort of get conversation uh, or, so if there are any concerns or if this is not a direction the board wants to go, that's also available as well. Mr. Kamaguchi. Yeah, I think I think um, I think my number one concern about this type of statement is that the majority of people that I've spoken to don't want this. So my concern is that by delivering this type of statement or position on license plate readers, we endorse uh, one of the bills. That's just my concern on for on on first glance and reading it. Would you propose that we take a stance against license plate readers altogether? I mean, that would be the stance that I would be in favor of, but I'm also curious on what other board members think. Judge Brown.
I would uh, be somewhat opposed to taking a stance one way or the other, but I do think we need to stress, regardless of what uh, the uh, council does, that any proposal have provisions for oversight by this board. Uh, I mean, the license plate readers are, are controversial. Most of the people I've talked to about it generally tend to favor them. But clearly there are possibilities of abuse, and I think that it is appropriate that we make it a strong position that the board have uh, the ability to help oversee this so that if there are uh, problems that we there's a place to com file a complaints with and to be investigated and reported back to the council. But I, I would be opposed to us getting into endorsing one proposal or the other or neither. Thank you, Judge Brown. Um, Dr. Hildreth and then Mr. Holloway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's a catch-22. I do have concerns around pro um, process and regulation, and so I was very much appreciative of Mr. Brian Hawker's presentation right now. But I'm going to have to start for myself. I would like to go on the record as a board member as I am opposed to the license plates readers. I believe that making a statement for a lesser of two evils blunts the opposition. So I would only be supportive of a resolution that opposes it and understanding the very careful and legitimate thought and concern that all 11 members of this board bring, I recognize that we might not be able to issue such a statement. So instead, one of the things that I would like to recommend, and I need to say I'm deeply appreciative of this draft, not only because it has colors on it, <laughs> um, more importantly, it has graphical analysis of what core concerns are and how these bills line up. I am very supportive of this board publishing maybe the same document but titled as analysis rather than a position that it is our standard and, and I actually think that Mr. Hofer gave us great guidance here I think we need to state as analytical principles right that there needs to be robust reporting metrics that was one of his phrases right for data-informed decision-making. So sometimes we may make a decision that this is bad policy because of that metric he gave about black women, like myself, yes. being misidentified, right? Yes. Robust reporting metrics for data-informed decision-making <clears throat> that look for disparate impact. These are all phrases that I copied down from his presentation. And there are two things that I will end this when we're talking just about an analytical framework, that there needs to be subject matter expertise. I have had to work very hard over the last few months to track this argument because every time there is a meeting, whether I went to the public meeting at the library or we're sitting here and we're listening to the great, I'm taking on new information that I have to think, think about and think where my orientation is. But I'm learning constantly. And I know that I am privileged where I sit as a learner. I can only imagine how difficult this is for others. So if we take the tools that we are presented and make sure we're putting them in an accessible way for people, Having subject matter expertise is critical. I am so grateful that we have some board members who fill that position. So I need to continue to urge those board members to speak up with clarity and particularity as you educate us and the members that we hope are watching this either live or will be watching it on tape going forward, right? That's one. My last point that came out of the Hofer presentation, and I wrote Member Hayes' name next to it, was his admonition to be clear to look for cost overruns, those hidden costs. You get it for a song, and we know this happens with luxury vehicles. 
the vehicle costs something, but they make their money back in the maintenance and upkeep because you can only take it to their special shop, right? What are the hidden costs? That kind of comes to subject matter expertise. It comes to data, but all of this is clear, dispassionate analysis. You've been so wonderful bringing that to us with this document and with the speakers. I ask this board to stand united to insist that we continue to produce, post, and make available the clear information so that data-driven decision-making and advocacy can ensue. Thank you. Mr. Holloway. They always tell me, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And uh, the people that I represent in the community from all walks of life, they are against this, uh, this license plate reader. And at one time, I looked kind of favorable that I was interested in it, but uh, after being stopped by a state trooper about two days before the November meeting, <clears throat> gave me some concerns that these people are right. They had some, and this guy was more concerned what kind of vehicle I was driving, you know, and really not the probable cause why I was stopped, you know. So I didn't get a citation. So apparently, you know, we get stopped for not what we do, sometimes what we look like, you know, so I'm not for it. Mr. Abdullah. Uh, I'm, I, I've also talked to uh, plenty of people in our community, and I think that as a board we have to be careful of the, the basic civil liberties that, you know, we uh, are dealing with. And so, again, I have the people that I've talked to Many of them are not for it, and, and as I think about it, I'm with you. As I think about it, uh, I just I, I have a hard time. I have a hard time with this, and the more I listen to it, and the more I listen to presenters, every time I listen to a new presenter, I'm having a harder time with it. So um, that would be for me as well. It would be a no. Mr. Camelgooch. Yeah, so I would like to note two things. Uh, thank you, board members, for expressing conversations that you've had outside of here. I would also like to mention that what also kind of puts a little, especially as, um, what's his name, Mr. Holford? Holford? Holford. Especially as he spoke, he mentioned that currently right now their oversight, is there's an attempt to roll back their oversight. Uh, to, to purchase more license plate readers in Oakland. So I think this is also like a national conversation that's happening. Um, and then also too, when I have a conversation with people, sometimes they may not understand what the license plate reader is, you know, trying to explain like, it's a camera that will take a photo of a license plate that will add you to a hot list that may, that may tag you or automate the traffic stop thing. Sometimes that's hard to, hard to fathom, but what they do know is they do know MMPD, which is usually where they go to. You know what I'm saying? It's one thing that they go. Um, and they've also paid attention to the struggles that we've had to provide proper oversight. So a lot of folks that I've spoken to have been like, I don't want the cameras, but also who's gonna actually be able to function as an oversight body of them? And provide us that clarity and information that uh, Dr. Hildreth mentioned. So I wanted to mention that too. And then three, I wanted to also express, I think the conversation that uh, the mentioning between what Dr. Hildreth said, um, Mr. Walter and Mr. Abdullah just mentioned, I, I'm under the mindset that I wish that a board position can hold all of that because we were put on this board to represent community members and our constituents. So I wanted to mention that if that was a way that we could display that information in this official board position or with the clarity of information that's here that holds the two bills, I think that would be great. Mr. Wynn. 
have a couple of questions for the director and, and, and doctor. Um, how much analysis has the city council done on this topic? That's, that's one. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me give you the rest of them. Um, second, are, are they asking for the COB for their opinion on this? In other words, are they listening to us as a board at all? about this? I'm not saying we shouldn't have an opinion. I'm just asking, are, are they listening? And then third, I've listened to all the experts. I've read all the data that you've provided for us so far. I don't, we haven't heard from, if we want to, a national law enforcement subject matter expert, other than someone at the Metro Police Department, about all the issues that we're concerned about. So do you know of subject matter experts in law enforcement from some of the larger well-known organizations like PERF or ICP or Noble or national sheriffs who we could zoom in to ask them the questions that we have about concerns about privacy and misuse of technology? Um, so first question on the council analysis. Um, you know, they have been working on this for over a year and have had several sessions uh, where they've brought in um, some experts, uh, they brought in uh, someone from Flock Safety, which is a manufacturer. They've brought in an, uh, someone from Vanderbilt who's doing research on um, uh, neighborhood uh, systems. And, they, and they've brought in, uh, they've had several other sessions that have done this. And it, and it does seem from the conversations that the, that the council members that are leading the different bills have been doing quite a bit of work um, to frame out their uh, legislation, um, drawing from other sources. So it does seem that, they, that there has been quite a bit of effort from the council to uh, try to uh, work on their bills. Um, as far as listening to the, the oversight board, um, I, you know, I, I think that there are many council members that take the oversight board's opinion very seriously. Um, you know, this is a, a, a body that's appointed uh, by or nominated by community members and confirmed by the Metro Council and we also have members uh, not council nominated members and mayoral members that um, you know make up this body and so this is a core component of governance in Nashville and um, if they're not taking the uh, perspective of the community oversight board seriously they really should um, and so I, I as far as specific members, I don't know. Um, but you know, the, when I've had conversations, uh, there there has been questions um, around, you know, whether the community oversight board will weigh in. Um, I've heard that from council members as well. Um, as far as law enforcement experts, I did reach out to an, at least one academic expert um, that studies law enforcement. I did not reach out to specific law enforcement organizations or um, or groups because I because I was focused on uh, trying to uh, either get academic experts I had several law professors I did, did not uh, want to be on because they didn't feel that their their specialties were as aligned um, uh, I reached out to several we reached out to several sociologists who work closely with police departments um, whose schedules could not work out so we did reach out to others but mainly focused on academic um, experts who do research with police departments, but we didn't, and not specifically on police organizations. I'll add to that that I have been approached by several council members asking why we haven't taken a position and asking us to take a position. Ms. McCree. Yes. Um, starting with majority of the members of the community that I've had a chance to engage surrounding LPRs, um, if bare minimum have hesitation about the privacy concerns, um, if not are completely against them. And this board has a responsibility and obligation as a board that was created and had so much support by community members to be kind of a guiding factor in how we move forward on this issue. And I know there's hesitation here um, on both sides because there's so 
there's still a lot of new information coming out and there's sometimes conflicting information um, still that we're receiving here. But I do think we have a responsibility uh, moving forward, um, gaining more speakers. I, I would be interested in hearing from speakers on the other side of this as well, just so that it's a balanced conversation moving forward. But I think we have an obligation as a board um, to take a position and to lead the community conversation one way or, or another. Mr. Kamaguchi. Yeah, with that being said, I would like to motion that our official position be one that we do not approve of the license plate readers at right now. Uh, any focused discussion on this motion? I will ask, do we want this position to be accompanied by the analysis included? Yeah, I think it. Yeah, I think it accompanies the analysis, but it's the official position of the board that we are not for the license plate readers right now. I'll ask another question to Dr. Villier. Um, we take a position that we are opposed to um, the expansion of license plate readers, but that if, say, nothing were to happen, say no bill passes in council, does that leave license plate readers that are currently allowed to run without regulation? Uh, so currently, mobile license plate readers are only regulated by state law, and so that, and that only has a data retention of 90 days. So, um, it would be allowed for, mobile license plate readers would be allowed for use um, as long as data was not retained for more than 90 days. Mr. Kamaguchi. I would also like to mention um, that I believe Captain Laura at one point in time said, I think the official position from MMPD is that they would not expand license plate readers if neither one of these bills were to pass. Um, Commander Lara, do you, um, if you want to, if you're able to clarify that. Good afternoon. Um, the position of the department is the department knows what's available and we're not, we're, we're leaving all options open at this time. We're just looking to see um, what passes or not. Um, but again, the department at this time has no uh, plans on moving forward until some legislation passes, um, but that's not saying that in the future that changes or not. Yeah. Any more focused discussion on the motion? Judge Brown. I think if we take a position that we oppose it, we're going to put ourselves in a bit of a difficult position then if we want to have oversight. I think we have risk, essentially, if we tell the council they shouldn't do it and they do it, they're not going to look favorably on us having any oversight thing. I would much prefer us to take a more positive position as to what the board has concerns about and that if this is done, because it is a council decision, if it is done, that the board have oversight. I think if we just say no, we're going to put ourselves in a, in a poor position then to argue for oversight or anything else. I'd rather see us say we, we're concerned about these items, the length of time they're retained, who has access to them, that we can take, ask the council to consider positions on that and that there be oversight on it rather than just saying no. I, I think if we say no, we're going we're gonna to shoot ourselves in the foot. Mr. Goddard. Yeah, I first had a, a question for Your Adelaide. microphone. Yes. What I'm interested in. Mr. Goddard, you got to turn on your microphone. Apparently someone else needs to turn it on for me. Thank you. Uh, my concern, Commander Larry, is if 
license plate readers are used by the police, whether it's pursuant to a legislation that passes or neither passes and, and the police decide they want to use them anyway. I would want to see a process where procedures for all the things that have been talked about, how long information is available, what it can be used for, what crimes are fed in for the hot list, that sort of thing, developed by the police with an opportunity for input by this board, or the reverse, the board recommends it and the police do that, as opposed to turning them on as we're thinking about what policies to use and so forth. Do you know whether the chief or the police department has a plan for the process of developing guidelines and turning these things on, anything like that? And whether there's an opportunity for our board to plug in. Sure. At this time, the police department doesn't have any plans on moving forward with this until we have uh, some type of legislation out and then they're going to look at their options. I will say this. Like any other technology we've used, we're never going to turn on the technology without having the policies in place. Um, if you look at the body cams, that was one of the right. first ones. We didn't just turn the body cams on. There was a long process of making sure that um, the, pro the policies were in place to protect uh, those who, um, you know, those in the community before we even thought about purchasing or anything else. So the policies are very important, and we're not going to just flip a switch on and go, let's use it and then figure it out. Uh, the chief and, and the staff are very, very, um, you know, take a lot of time and uh, there's a lot of effort making sure that we have the right policies in place before any technology is put into play. And so I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be the same with any other technology that comes in the future. But like I said, at this time, the department doesn't have any, any plans on, um, at this time, doesn't have any plans on uh, moving forward with license plate readers uh, until we at least see some legislation that's been passed. I understand. Thank you, sir. Let's say, say I'm probably a no vote on this and I want to explain that. Um, I am uncomfortable not having heard from a credible source on the benefits of this technology. I don't view the manufacturers as necessarily that. I don't mean to say that, but there's, there ought to be other credible sources. And to take a position I'm opposed, knowing I'm ignorant of that is, is difficult for me at this point. Thank you. Mr. Kamaguchi. Uh Thank you for that. I think... Like you said, a manufacturer is not the authority on this issue. I also want to note that a lot of the folks, I think one of the one of the people from EFF was like, the data isn't conclusive on what it does. So I think that is a glaring sign that for safety precautions and for concerns, especially when it comes to the majority of misreads, I think it was even mentioned today, and it's been mentioned several times, come from the tool misreading black folks. So I think, like, my motion is out of just safety and concern that if we continue to move forward, we're going to end up in a place where we have proprietary technology that there's no real idea of what's going on with it and the difficulty in actually having proper oversight right now. So, Mr. Witzel. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to go on record to say that I am too against um, the LPRs. And I was thinking about what uh, Judge Brown said about, um, I, I see what he's saying about, <clears throat> I think he's thinking strategically uh, if, this, if this were to happen, um, us having oversight. But I feel like that is um, uh, across the bridge, that bridge when we get there type thing, and that we should be focused on um, our the stance of not having LPRs, and if we need to fight for oversight later, then that's what we should do at that time. Dr. Eldred. Thank you. Um, and I'm so grateful to the board members for bringing everything out and putting it on the table. I would like to say that going forward, because we've been in this learning mode since we've been stood up, um, the list of organizations to check the, law, the national law enforcement list that member Wynn brought forward, I would love for that to, us to put that in our Rolodex and to make sure that when we do this in the future, we do this because with time being of the essence, in no way do I want to forestall this conversation another month for another meeting. Mm -hmm. I so wish we had, this is, this, is not a, this is not a complaint. This is, we keep learning as we going, right? Um, I have loved the presentations we've had. 
and I wish we had had one or two of those right here. And having said all that, I will say, in September, I was sitting where Member Brown advocated. I thought it was important for our voice to come out and say we have some control rather than not. I am now moved to the point that no matter what I would have heard from the credible sources today, nothing outweighs my concern about the safety of the members of my community and my family who share my history, my culture, my phenotype, my skin color, my build, the, the phenotype and structure of my husband, of my sons and nephews, nothing would dissuade me to believe that LPRs are a good thing right now. So my answer is I will support this motion against LPRs. And it is my hope that as we continue to grow and get better, this process has been amazing. And the next step up is to take that list and kind of have a standard see if we can always get somebody from one of those national to bring us a total. Thank you. Mr. Holloway's. Like I said before, uh, the, the, we, the board represent the people in the community. The people in the community voted for this board. Either we're going to stand for them or we're not. Now, if we're not going to stand for the, for the community, then we need to disband. Director Fitchard. Your microphone is not on. On how the oversight of those are going. And so would you be able to provide the board some information regarding the body one camera um, uh, program? Yeah, I understand your concern, uh, Director. What I'll do is I'll take your concern back to the chief's office and, and see how we want to move forward with that. But I'm sure we can get you something. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Hayes. For all, the, uh, all of the reasons that Dr. Hildreth mentioned, I, I'm also opposed to the uh, license plate readers, uh, but also in addition to that, because of the presentation that we had, uh, it it definitely says that there are concerns across the country with this, and there needs to be some oversight. And I don't even know if this board is even expert enough to do the oversight uh, based on that presentation. Uh, and and one other thing is is that uh, the lack of community engagement. Uh, there has, I mean, I think this board has tried to engage the community, but I don't know how many other organizations have really tried to inform the community on this. So that, that's why I would definitely vote no right now. Any more focused discussion on the motion? I will ask, does it need to be amended? to include the analysis. I'm not sure formally if it does. If, if you have an okay. answer. <laughs> yeah, I think you need to flesh out what the motion is and make it very clear for the record. I would say you do. Okay, I motion that the board take an official position that we are opposed to license plate readers um, that also include the breakdown of the two bills that are currently in city council. I think that's the mm -hmm. um, Member Campbell Gooch, is your motion that after due consideration of the two uh, proposed ordinances that are there and the careful analysis that we have above, we as a board move to oppose the passage of either that we are not in, fade, in favor of license plates readers. Does that do it? Yes, and that be delivered in writing. If it's possible with this analysis, I would like to see 
some language about what it actually takes to provide oversight for something as complicated as this? You know, so what types of engineers are required or, you know, what skill set is required for somebody who's going to be um, providing oversight? Mr. Hayes. Uh, should we also um, add an amendment to address the issue of if we do nothing? Because it seems like there still needs to be some regulation on the, ex the because I, my understanding is that uh, there can still be mobile units. So, but there's no regulation if we do nothing. Dr. Eldred. Thank you, and forgive me for patching this together. I took a picture of two of the slides that Mr. Hofer presented. So one of them under elements of required documents, you had the um, bullets for the surveillance impact report and the surveillance use policy. I think those may get to some of the specific elements you were talking about. So maybe incorporation of that slide and then there was a second slide also titled elements of the required documents, but it was for the annual report. So that may get to some of the reporting pieces, but again, if I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about Member Campbell Gooch's motion, the motion is saying, we have compared the two bills, and you have the comparison in it, and we have received some um, expert presentations that indicate to do this well, to have the subject matter expertise and capacity, elements of monitoring, reporting, et cetera, pulling from the bullets, from those two slides that I talked about are required. We hereby find that we don't have all that and we're against it, <laughs> basically. Is this what we're doing? Okay. And I can share, oops. And if necessary, I don't know if you're gonna be able to get the presentation, but if you need my pictures of what we're talking about, I can get those to staff after the meeting. I have a copy of the presentation that I can email out. You want to try to dress that up real fast? Let me try to put that in one amendment real quick. Okay, here we go. I'm going to try. Do we need to withdraw any motions? I don't know where we're at with this. To make it clean, let's withdraw the first motion and then state your motion clearly, and then we'll need a second. And you know. Okay, I would like to form formally withdraw my first motion. Um, and now I would like to motion that in writing, the community oversight takes a an official stance that they are opposed to the two license plate reader bills that are currently going through city council. And it should include that we have compared these two bills. We have also talking talked to subject matter experts and those subject matter experts have communicated to us elements of oversight. And since we do not have these things, we oppose them. I would also like to include that we have also, community members have also voiced disapproval. So that's the full motion. Second. Motion has been seconded. Any focused discussion on this motion? If there isn't, I'll do a roll call vote here. Mr. Holloway? Mr. Wynn? No. Ms. McCree? Yes. Mr. Goddard? Yes, Mr. Witzel? Aye. M Dr. Hildreth? Aye. I vote aye as well. Uh, Mr. Campbell Gooch? Aye. Mr. Hayes? Aye. Judge Brown? No. Mr. Abdullah? Aye. I think the motion passes then. So, procedure here, I will. I don't know if you could um, amend the analysis to include that language, Dr. Valier. Um, I will amend the uh, document with the help of Director Fitchard and uh, run anything by the chair before um, it's released. Great. Thank you. Next thing on the agenda, um, let's do the approval of the minutes here quickly. Um, if anybody wants to move 
wants to move to approve the, approve the minutes. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Is there a second? I second that motion. Thank you, Ms. McCree. Um, any focused discussion on the minutes? Does anyone have any edits? If not, all in favor of approving the minutes say aye. aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Um, I'll get to what I wanted to talk to in my chair remarks. Um, there were two issues I wanted to discuss. First was my letter to Chief Drake, which was also sent to you all. Um, after the PRR responses that we received um, in which Chief Drake indicated that he could not legally impose more punishment on police officers because they had already been disciplined for a violation. Um, my response was that uh, in the same legal advice that they were using from Metro Legal, um, Metro Legal indicated that if new violations were found, that um, new discipline could be imposed on the police officer. So uh, I indicated that to Chief Drake, but we have yet to hear a response. Um, I just wanted to open the floor for discussion in case board members had any questions or wanted to discuss that any more. Mr. Kamaguchi. Um, thank you for doing that. I did read the uh, letter. Thank you for penning that letter. Um, it moved really well. What are our legal options here um, if Chief Drake or there's no further action taken? Um, I'm not sure if our legal counsel can answer that. If you're not, so our legal counsel couldn't be here today, so we have someone joining us from Metro Legal. Yes. We're appreciative. And I'll be candid. I would need time to look into that and get the board an answer. And just for clarity, could you restate your question so that I can get an answer to the board? Yeah, so uh, real fast, what, what I'm curious about is I know that we have voiced we have delivered um, punishment to police officers. And we have, and now it's being said that we technically can't do that, which is in violation of the charter. So I'm curious if we get a response from Chief Drake that's like, I said what I said, basically, <laughs> and I'm not doing anything. What legal recourse? Do we have any legal options okay. that we can consider because I'm wanting to plan for that now so we don't end up getting stuck right here over and over again. I think to clarify, Mr. Kamaguchi, the response was to say that no further discipline could be imposed for the same violation, not that they couldn't impose our additional violations. Yeah. So that question is still up in the air and has yet to be answered. Any other questions about that, Director Fitchard? Well, I just want to like make it clear. I have the letter here so that we all are on the same sheet of music. And so basically, we had four um, PRs that we sent to Chief Drake. Two of them came back where he stated that that he would he could not they could not be the punishment or the recommendation for discipline could not be legally imposed. And so there was some discussion between. Um, we asked for some clarification with that, and so Metro Legal weighed in on that. And <clears throat> what Metro Legal said was if a new and separate policy violation is discovered by the COB or by MMPD upon further investigation of the matter, then an additional new disciplinary process could begin against the employee based on that separate policy violation that was discovered. And in those two PRRs, that was what was, that's what took place. We imposed we had, um, there was where an officer was disciplined for one thing, but then we had a additional findings. And what he did was clump those together and basically said it couldn't be legally imposed. And so that's the question that we have for you, Ms. Brown, to, um, or Attorney Brown, to ask Metro Legal to weigh in on that. Thank you, Director Pritchard. Any other questions about that? Um, if not, the second thing I wanted to address in 
right before you left, Mr. Hayes, I know you have to leave early, is four of our members, our, our terms are ending, um, and we could be reappointed. I don't know if board members are seeking reappointment, um, but I also want to note that three members of the executive committee, um, their terms will end as well. That's my term, Mr. Campbell Gooch's term, and Mr. Goddard's term. So come February, since um, our last meeting could potentially be in January, um, there might not be an entire executive committee except for Mr. Hayes, who would, I think, step in as acting chair. Um, and the board would then have to hold uh, an election for uh, executive committee positions at that time. Any questions about that? Um, there could be a nominations committee meeting formed, but I think you may want to wait until after new board members have been appointed. Um, but that I think that's up to the board as well. Any discussion about that? If not, I will, yeah, Mr. Goddard. Dr. Dusray, backing up one point, another concern that was discussed at the Executive Committee um, was that by the time we got finished with our process on, on the decisions on the officers, the police department, the chief had already gone through his process in the civil service and some <laughs> number of those had already been decided without input from us. And concern was expressed, I expressed concern, others had it, that our, the charter amendment that created this board says it has the authority to make recommendations and the process is broken if there's not time for us to make those recommendations. And we may need to move more quickly, the chief may need to wait some, whatever, but there's something broken there to my mind that needs to be fixed. We didn't come up with a resolution, but identified that as something for the executive director uh, to, to engage on. Yes, Thank and you. it's a good point. At the end of my letter, I do ask, I did ask uh, Chief Drake to stay any um, issuing of discipline on cases that we are both working on um, so that we avoid that in the future. But I think we need to have a more permanent right. solution okay. to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Um, I think we can move to Director Fitchard for the Executive Director's Report. All right, thank you. Um, so December 2021's report, um, our staff members are still inside of the office working regular business hours. Um, of course, we are wearing masks and social distancing as required. Um, we have interviewed um, for the position of community liaison and administrative assistant. Those went well, and hopefully we can make um, a decision to select someone. If not next week, it'll be the first part of the year since People are not available right now for the holidays. Um, so we continue to have training. We just got back from the NACO's annual conference in Tucson, Arizona, which was a four-day in-person training, and it was really, really informative, and I think it was really helpful to where um, NACO and where all of the community oversight boards and police accountability boards are heading in 2022. And we can share more of that information with you and you would be able to um, go online and look. They presented, they also um, gave us the documentation where we could download kind of like what they did the last time in Detroit. So I thought it was super informative um, and just refreshing to get with other people and find out what was happening across the country. And after the George Floyd um, incident, just knowing how many cities across this country, there's 18,000 police departments, and I think um, one of the presenters said that there were um, over 250 new um, oversight boards who are trying to form. And so it's been a challenge. We're not the only city that has had challenges. Um, people were very interested in how we were doing because of our democratic process in establishing this board. So I thought it went well. Um, and so you can talk to some of um, our staff members and board members to get more information. Um, I attended a training, um, Reimagining re Community Safety, The Promise of Transformation and the Challenges to Overcome. That was a webinar. Um, on Thursday, December the 2nd, I shared info about the COB with the National Panhellenic Council of Nashville. Um, and on Tuesday, December the 7th, I shared info about the COB at MNPD's Interpersonal Crimes Branch Monthly Meeting, which was hosted by Captain Hunsicker. 
Um, Dr. Valier also attended a, um, a lot of different trainings as well. Um, he attended the Special Committee on Jail, Jail Data, Reimagining Community Safety, the Neighbor to Neighbor Meeting on Uses of Technology, Advancing the Science and Practices of Street Outreach, and the Future of Street Outreach in Illinois, and also a Healthy and Free Tennessee sta Statewide Training on Messaging. Um, Chief Drake responded to the board's soft empty hand control reporting advisory report, and we're going to get into that a little later, so I'm not going to dive into that. We've had a total of three investigative complaints since our last board meeting in November. We've also had a total of three non-complaint calls for service, but that doesn't incorporate the other. We have lots of calls that come in. They're not necessarily investigative calls, but they're calls um, and so we just haven't added those into our um, metrics, but I'll talk a little bit about those um, later. Um, so we have really had a steady climb of, in, of complaints. We compared to last year, we had 37 last year, and as of uh, this month, December, we have a total of 61. So 37 in 2020, so far we have 61 complaints. Or I'm sorry, yeah, 61 complaints. Um, there's been no issues with receiving our uh, requested records. That has been resolved, it seems, and it's working really well, and I'm very pleased with that, um, as well as getting the body-worn camera footage, is too. So that's been good. Um, on Thursday, December the 16th, there was an officer-involved shooting. Of course, we were in Arizona, and I was notified by Commander Lara on Thursday, December 16th at 3.58 a.m. that a fatal police shooting occurred in Madison. Commander um, gave me a preliminary update of the information that was available. Um, he and he notified me that, uh, well, I notified him that our team was in Arizona and we wouldn't be responding to the scene. Um, he also called back at around 4.50 a.m. with Captain Blaisdell um, to give me follow-up information on that shooting. Um, and answered all my questions. Um, he also shared the body-worn camera footage with our investigative staff through the secured shared folder. Um, and I uh, have initiated a investigation into the shooting and I'll request that the district attorney general release the records immediately following the TBI's completed investigation so that we can move forward on these um, investigations into um, these deadly police shootings. Um, we've, we had uh, a response from MMPD from Chief um, Drake on December the 2nd in regards to four resolution reports that we sent over. Um, on 2020-005, the response to the recommendation was cannot legally impose the recommendation. Um, complaint 2020-006, the response to the recommendation is he accepted the conclusion of not sustained. Um, complaint 2020 Dash 018, his response to the recommendation was cannot legally impose a recommendation. And his response to 2020-028 was um, he accepted the conclusion of unfounded. Um, we sent a letter to Chief of Police um, with the con consultation of the executive committee. That was by Chair Martinez. He just talked about that. Um, and, uh, Regarding, his, regarding Chief's response to the board's proposed resolution reports and requesting specific answers to his recommendations. Um, and that letter is also posted on our website at national.gov. I'll present to you one PRR this afternoon. Um, we, I went to a force review board and I was as a voting member on Monday, December the 6th. Um, and so as we continue to receive and review cases regarding deadly police shootings, um, we continue to discuss, monitor, and find ways to complete those very important cases with limited investigative staff. Um, we have been researching and seeking input from other peer agencies about best practices for auditing and investigating deadly shootings. And we learned some of that information at the course, over the course of this four-day event. So we have some new information um, that we can dive into to determine how we can get some of this stuff done really quickly to, satis to the satisfaction of our complainants as well. Um, I was accepted and added to the stakeholder committee um, for the MMPD CIT co-response pilot, so I will be on that committee. Um, and then I'm moving into the budget cycle. We're moving into the budget cycle, and so um, myself, A.D. Clausey, Dr. Valier, and member Hildreth, we attended the mayor's budget and performance management team's um, first budget discussion. Um, that 
it was really just a um, quick overview of what our needs were. Um, I also sent you something that Dr. Hildreth thought would be helpful to you. Did you want to say anything about it, um, Dr. Hildreth? Director Fitcher, you're doing a great job. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. You know, I will sound like a broken record to my colleagues here and also to the community because the reason we're here is you asked us to sit here. We have to understand not only what our needs are on the board, but the best way to advocate for it. And I would say that sitting in that meeting, I found that it was a very collegial conversation. It, it, it sort of sits in the space of help us help you. So if we ask for new positions, we need to also present information. What would be the anticipated caseload or workload? How do those workloads line up against other exemplars? And probably most important for us is to begin to understand the budget cycle. Who else is competing for limited dollars in the pot? What is the timeline? When do we have to get this done? So looking at the links to the public information about the budget, having all of us have it, is really important. Some of it is very, not complicated, but it's hidden. You have to go through 700 pages on a PDF mm -hmm. to find where our section is. Mm -hmm. And even though the table of contents will say which agency we are, even in that table of contents, you don't have a hyperlink where if I clicked on that, it would take me through 600 mm -hmm. pages and land me to where we need to be right. So we need to work together mm -hmm. to find ways to find our sections, to pull them out and maybe repost those small PDFs. But the final bit on this is we can know our budget well, but do we know the other entities' budgets? For example, if we think mental health positions are important or being able to watch those, where are the dollars for those mental health positions? Are there a couple hidden in the police department budget? Are some of them in the school's budget because they're looking at schools? You follow what we're saying? Mm -hmm. Sometimes our best exemplars or allies are hidden in some spaces mm -hmm. that we're not aware of. So we really wanted to make sure that all of us, we and you, know that there are clear benchmarks. I mean, you see that this graphic is beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Simplifies it. We need to know where it is, and we need to put them on our calendars as well so that you can hold us accountable, and we can do the work through the budget just mm -hmm. as we spent time figuring out how to do the work through the legislature or city council. Right. So thank you. Thank you. And since we have formed a budget committee for for this office, I'm sorry, for this board, um, I would like to have a meeting sometime in January. We talked about that, and I'll send you all out a um, an invitation. I did want to mention that when on this graphic that we um, that Dr. Hildreth sent over um, that is on Metro's website, there was some error of uh, areas of emphasis that the mayor has. Um, the administration has announced six priorities for the capital program. Um, the six areas of emphasis is education, neighborhoods and community engagement, housing, public safety and justice, transportation, infrastructure, sustainability, and effective government. Under public safety and justice, they have included the community oversight board as one of those priorities, as well as the body camera pilot program and reducing disparities. And so I was very pleased to see that that has become a priority for the administration. And so... Um, I also attended a, um, a department head meeting, and on, that was on Friday, December the 10th, and Representative Jim Cooper was the guest speaker talking about redistricting and some other things on the agenda. Um, I met with the mayor's policy director and COB liaison, Director John Bunton, on Friday, December the 10th as well, and we discussed various topics regarding the COB um, and so, of course, um, Chair Martinez talked about the members um, who are expiring terms. I won't go over that. Um, and we still need to talk about and we still are working towards finding the information to support a um, survivor resources in regards to, like, I think we need a social worker on staff. And so we are working with the research team to 
really get that information so that we have the, you know, the data to show you why that is needed. And while we were at the conference, we met many people who are working um, within the accountability boards that deal with the mental health perspective. So um, it's not um, so far removed. It's something that is done um, pretty much, it's standard in a lot of the offices across this country. And so that is the end of my report. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I'll take them now. Mr. Holloway. Yes, um, that shooting that took place uh, while uh, the entire staff was out of town, that's just a rare situation, but it shouldn't happen again. There always should be a person on call. I know during the holidays, you know, you know, everybody want to be at home with their family, and we got to pick and choose who going to be at home with the family and who going to be out dealing with the city. So there ought to be at least one person here in town to respond to the call. So, but that's just a real situation. It may not happen again, but we want to be prepared in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Goddard, your name tag is turned. I'm not sure. Thank you. Any other, Mr. Campbell Gooch? Yeah, uh, um, Executive Director, I noticed you said that we went from our complaints have almost doubled between uh, what we recorded last year and what we recorded this year. Is there any patterns or anything, or what are you noticing as far as why it has doubled? Well, I think one, two things. One of them is that people are more aware that we're we're here, right? And that the more that we spend time, you know, in the community advocating for the board and letting people know what our services are, the more people that utilize our services. Um, and so, even when we get calls in, sometimes like now we're receiving calls from people who have complaints from you know way back, right? And so we can't assist them with it, but at least we can still listen to what has been happening. And so I haven't really seen um, a pattern of particular types and styles, but that is in the complaint log, so we can look at that. Um, but it seems like um, they just kind of are, I, I wouldn't say it's the same type of complaint that's coming through every, every time we get a call. They're all a different. There are no other questions. We can move on to the discussion of the soft, empty hand control response from Chief Drake. All right, thank you. Um, you know, as we discussed at a board meeting several times ago, I uh, um, about having a guest uh, when we discussed sort of the responses from the police department. I invited Commander Laura to also sit in to discuss the responses from uh, the chief and, uh, and answer any questions from the board. Uh, we did receive the response uh, on the soft empty hand control report, and Commander Lara did send roll call trainings and updated policies, which should have been forwarded to the board this morning. Um, so we did receive that uh, yesterday, and we've had a chance to review those today. Um, both of the recommendations were accepted by the police department, um, and the uh, the uh, roll call training and updated uh, policies do incorporate. Um, the the uh, recommendations uh, within the use of force policy and reporting policies, um, and the roll call training does show that there that there's going to be an implementation that's consistent with the report. Um, so I I think and then um, so I'd like to open it up if there's any questions from the board uh, for Commander Lara about um, how this is going to be implemented or um, on. Any other concerns from the board? Dr. Eldreth. Thank you. Commander Laura, um, I want to extend my personal thanks as a member of the board and being a conversation partner around this to you. And please send the thanks also up to the chief. Appreciate the careful review and the agreement. But not just, I was very appreciative to receive a copy of the letter, but even more gratified to hear about the amended roll call trainings, et cetera. And so that's the way I, I think that we envision and the people who put us in the seats were envisioning that this would work 
and I just want to express my gratitude and ask you to convey that. Thank you. Any other questions for Commander Lara? Too many buttons. Uh, Commander, the, one of the questions was about report that, uh, and I certainly commend Chief for adopting our resolution and it, looking at the forums looks like it's a good way to report it, but uh, what sort of summaries are going to be, be done uh, with, the, with this information that you're gaining? Uh, we had talked it in some of our stuff about having uh, quarterly or semi-annual reports of uh, what conclusions we can draw from those reports. And I wasn't clear where that fell, fell in. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that question. Um, I will go back to the chief, uh, chief's office and see exactly uh, on that end what is going to be put together, if there's going to be something that's going to be compiled about all this information so that you'll have. Um, I don't have that information in front of me right now, but I can find out and I'll get that to you, sir. Right. I understand it's a short yes. term. We're starting the first of the month, but um, I think that is something to take a look at. We've, sure. We gathered this data. Now what are we going to do with it? So uh, in the response, um, so there is a uh, annual report that's required in the use of force policy. Um, so there will be a, an annual report. Part of the second recommendation from the use of the from soft empty hand control report from the board um, was around quarterly and annual reporting with some specific breakdowns. The response from the chief said that they would be updating the um, uh, data dashboard. And, and I'll be meeting with the, tech, the team at the police department next week to uh, review the updates that they'll be making to the data dashboard. Um, and they did say the data will be downloadable. Um, do you, uh, Commander Lara, do you know if there's been discussion about sort of the weighing the use of the data dashboard versus a quarterly report, which would be more official statistics from the police department on, on numbers rather than a uh, live dashboard? Uh, I have not been part of those conversations, but um, what I'll do again is that specific information, which I know you're probably getting uh, with the, the executive staff to go over the dashboard, you'll get probably more accurate information than what I have right now. But I will go back and uh, take that concern to the chief and figure out exactly what um, what the plans are for the future. But like I said, I think you already have a scheduled meeting, so you should be able to get a lot of that information during that meeting as well. Mr. Kamagooch. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Valier, so my, my question was around data too. So Dr. Valier, with this change, or with these changes in policy, what, and reporting, what, as board members, what should we be looking for when it comes to the, the change that it's gonna have in the data that we receive? Um, so as far as changes, you know, the, the same data that, are, that we've already been receiving will be the same. Um, what there'll be a new additional source of data, so there will be an additional form that will um, have information on uses of on uses of force that don't rise to the to the current level as of 2021 and 2022 will be tracked. And so what will what will happen is there'll be additional information where uh, additional analyses can be done and have a more comprehensive. Over, overarching view of the types of force that are used. And I think it will be a helpful asset for the police department and will help um, the community understand and the board understand um, all of the types of force that are, that are being used. And I do think um, when this data exists, um, it will be helpful for supervisors and will be helpful for the department. And um, it's, it's, I think it's clear from the roll call training and policy revisions that there was some careful uh, work that's gone into making sure that the definitions are clear um, and are, can be understandable. Um, and so I, I think that there's a, um, there will be better reporting in the future that will help clarify for the board and for the public around um, how frequently these types of force are used. If I could say, you know, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that Chief Drake carefully and thoughtfully reviewed the Community Oversight Board's recommendations, uh, Policing Policy Commission reports recommendations, 
also researched um, many of the, the, uh, the departments that Dr. Valier had brought up in the past. Um, and he took all that information and he crafted this policy as well as the forms um, in response to those recommendations. So he took everything into account. And again, it wasn't just one thing. He, he went and took everything. And then also he made clear that he wanted this implemented as soon as possible. And that's why everything was sent out so that it can be implemented by January 1st of 2022. So I just wanted the board to understand that you know, this was really well thought out and crafted, you know, with all the input that the COB and policy, policing policy recommendations gave as well. Mr. Wynn. Commander, are you all using ComStat? Are you all using ComStat? No, sir, we're not, we're not using the ComStat format anymore. So how do the precinct commanders report to the chief about prime data? Is that a, is that a weekly, monthly meeting they have? So we have a weekly staff meeting and where the, the each uh, precinct gives the, the issues that they're facing in their precincts. Um, and then uh, there's a, a meeting up with all of the other divisions to see how we can each help each other to combat those issues and, and come up with answers and resources for those uh, to address those issues. Is, is the 108 data, is that available in, during those meetings as a comparison from precinct to precinct? I know in the past, the, the, the peer pressure from commander to commander to, to look at their workload, their their product, their you know, the crime makes a difference when they're reporting it to the chief. And I just wondered if this new data is going to be part of that report as a comparison from precinct to precinct. That may be something that they're they're giving to him separately, but in the staff meetings, the chief's only concern is the crime. Is crime going down or is our city safe and are your precincts safe? And so it's not the comp stat model that was in the past where you give a lot of numbers right. and you know how many stops you made, this and that. We don't use those that model anymore. We're looking at how many crimes are committed, um, what resources are being placed uh, to help with those, uh, what kind of outreach are we doing, what are the different um, methods that we're using, different resources we're using to try to combat that crime. Um, so it's not a numbers game like it may have been in the past. It's really uh, we want to know what exactly is causing the root of, of the, the issues we're having and how we're addressing them. Uh, and so our meetings are not numbers driven. Uh, they're, they're in the sense of, you know, what our proactivity is. It's, is crime going down? And that's what the chief uh, is really focusing on. Well, I, ho I hope they look at this data because, you know, shift by shift, the data different in some precincts. Yes. And, and I believe that the the commanders themselves are reviewing all data, all 108s, everything, every 108 that's um, that's filled out, every runaway investigation goes up to the commander at the very, uh, you know, to, to be reviewed. So they know what the 108s are happening and what type of force is being used as it goes up the chain of command. Um, but again, when it comes to um, staff meetings and, and that, um, at this point, we're not using that as one of the measurements of what we're doing. We're looking at crime and is it going up or going down and what can we do to keep the city safe in, in these precincts. Thank you. Thank you, sir. There are no other questions. Um, do we need to act on our, the deferred recommendation or? Um, the deferred recommendation was deferred for two meetings. So uh, I do believe that there's an action required um, uh, that action could be an indefinite deferral, which would sort of take it off the table. Um, uh, and so, but I do think on the deferred recommendation to council, um, there would need to be an action since it was deferred from a vote to this meeting. Can you explain um, what the recommendation to council was again? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as part of the uh, initial, as part of the report, um, there was a recommendation to Metro Council um, to pass an ordinance that would um, set up a quarterly and annual reporting process that would include soft empty hand control uh, when there was no report of an injury. Um, and part of that language was, was uh, that language instead of being made as the recommendation was put into the second recommendation of the report, uh, which uh, uh, was accepted by the police department and they'll you know will be additional reporting in the dashboard um, and so that recommendation is uh, is back for this meeting mr goddard 
I'm confused. I thought it was put in the recommendation so it would go to the police department. Now they've accepted it. What is still alive? Um, as far as I understood, the third recommendation was deferred and the language was added to the second recommendation. So there was additional language added to the second recommendation and the deferral of the third recommendation. And what was the third recommendation? The third recommendation was on an ordinance uh, to Metro Council. Proposing an ordinance, proposing that Metro Council. All right, well, I would yeah. move that we not adopt that recommendation and wait and see how it plays out with the reporting that's been discussed this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Any focused discussion on that? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Motion passes. Um, thank you, Dr. Ritter. Thank you, Commander Laura. Thank you. Um, now we can go to the proposed resolution reports and Director Fitcher. All right, this proposed resolution report is CC 2020-020. It's a complaint from an individual that was received on May 29, 2020. It primarily is revolving around an interaction that occurred on May 21st, 2020, involving himself, his passenger, and four MMPD officers who arrived on scene. There was a secondary but related complaint against a fifth MMPD officer, a sergeant, who was assigned by the OPA to investigate his complaint to them. The complainant said that he and his passenger were detained for about an hour for an alleged traffic infraction. The complainant and passenger reported being told to sit in the car on a hot day with the engine off and the windows rolled up. The complainant suspected that he and his passenger were pulled over because they were black men and all four officers who arrived on the scene were white. The complainant also stated during his complaint with us that he had filed a complaint with the Office of Professional Accountability, but did not believe the sergeant who was assigned to investigate it was doing anything to help. For that reason, an allegation of deficient performance was also investigated against the fifth officer, the sergeant. Ultimately, we sustained violations against three of the five officers, Officer 1 and Officer 2 from the initial traffic stop and the sergeant with the OPA. During our investigation, it was determined that the complainant and his passenger had pulled into the parking lot of a restaurant and upon seeing that it was closed, exited <clears throat> excuse me, onto a separate street before parking at a gas station. Upon exiting the car, the complainant is instructed to get back inside by Officer One, who had followed him from the restaurant and parked behind him. Officer One approaches the window and tells the complainant he is getting a ticket for avoiding the traffic light. A second patrol vehicle with officers two and three arrive. The complainant informs officer one that he was not trying to avoid the traffic light, just trying to get something to eat because um, he had pulled into a restaurant parking lot. Nonetheless, officer one states that she was going to issue him a ticket for going through the parking lot. I want to highlight a few findings related to the traffic infraction because it is relevant to sustaining the finding of obstruction of rights against Officer One. The complainant was, number one, the complainant was initially driving on Clifton Avenue away from downtown. When the complainant turned into the restaurant parking lot on his left, the gas station that he ultimately parks in is in on his right. The traffic light at Clifton and 28th Avenue North was immediately in front of him, but he would not have had to go through the light in order to turn into the gas station. Officer One was parked in the parking lot of the restaurant in a clearly marked patrol vehicle, and the complainant reports seeing her there, which was one reason why they thought the restaurant was still open. Officer One and the other involved officers were part of a formerly named flex unit that was assigned that particular day to assist the crime suppression unit with, as Officer Two described his duties that day, was getting as many drugs off the street as possible. Prior to stopping the complainant, the crime suppression unit had informed Officer One and the North Flex unit that the passenger was a known drug dealer. 
Based on all the evidence, exhibits, and interviews, I find that it is more likely than not that the ticket was pretextual excuse for Officer One to delay this encounter in order to call for the K-9 unit. Ultimately, Officer One states that she did not issue a traffic ticket to the complainant because he was so cooperative. However, policy requires that voided tickets of this nature be copied and sent to the traffic bureau in court. This was admittedly done by Officer One in this case, so a violation of adherence to policy was sustained. According to the CAD report, the encounter began at 5.06 p.m. and ended at 5.42 p.m. The recorded temperature that day reached 86 degrees Fahrenheit. A precise time of how long the complainant and passenger were in the un air conditioned vehicle could not be determined, but from the CAT report, the K-9 was requested at 513, and the officer four, which is the K-9 officer, reported arriving about 14 minutes later at 527 p.m. The complainant reports asking and being given permission to turn on the air conditioner sometime between when he was stopped and the arrival of K-9. When the sergeant from the OPA turned in his findings and report, his supervisors found that he was deficient in his performance for, among other things, not recording his interview of the complainant, not interviewing the passenger at all, not interviewing three of the four involved officers, and not reviewing the CAD report. He was disciplined with reviewing, he was disciplined, and his discipline was review your training. You have to look at a PowerPoint. Um, while he was also found, while, while we also found his performance to be deficient and sustained that allegation, we did not make any additional disciplinary recommendations based on the same violation that the OPA already went through the disciplinary process of. As to Officer One, I sustained a finding of obstruction of justice, a Category B offense, and after reviewing her disciplinary record, recommend eight-day suspension, which is the lowest amount per the disciplinary grid for a first offense. I also sustained the allegation that she failed to adhere to policy by not voiding the traffic infraction. As to Officer Two, I sustained a finding of abusive treatment, also a Category B offense, and recommended an eight-day suspension. Neither Officer One nor Officer Two had any relevant disciplinary history. Against Officers Three and Four, we did not sustain any of the allegations. And that is the uh, report. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Director Pitchard. Mr. Goddard. Oh. <laughs> any questions from the board? Mr. Campbell Gooch. Um, I did have a question. I was going to wait till after, but um, point of concern is where we have um, officers again not turning in their daily activity reports. I noticed that as I was looking through the thing, I said I think Officer Three, Officer Two, and Officer One all have missing daily activity reports, and I know we talked about how that limits our investigations. Um, I just wanted to note that, and I'm not sure what we do about that, but I just wanted to note that if that's a continual thing, it, it, it'll become an issue in the future. Dr. Hildreth. Thank you, Member Campbell-Gooch. I saw that as well, and I was going to raise that after we take the vote. So what I'm going to ask is if we can finish this transaction, and then I would like to ask Commander Laura to come speak to us and just join us in dialogue about what we're noticing with that trend of non-reports. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Any other questions for Director Fitchard on the proposed resolution report? Judge Brown. Yeah. Uh, I know we had the uh, daily activity report come up in one of our earlier investigations, and uh, it looks like to me the department is taking cognizance of that. In fact, they did impose a discipline for the, the officer that had the most, that had 17 failures. So it looks like the department, if I understand it, is taking those reports more seriously. And there's been some, as I understood it from before, there were some changes to the policy about those reports, and they're going to be changed. But uh, I was glad to see the department had, had looked at it and took at least some action on it. Thanks, sir. Um, so with the... Um, the sheets that we, the, the activity sheets, we're not filling out activity sheets anymore. And I think uh, we had talked about that in the past where they, everything is now being uh, recorded in our CAD system. And so everything is uh, from our ARL, which allows you to see where officers are 
to when they check in and check out of calls. It's all recorded, so we're not using those sheets anymore. We're still able to find out where they're at um, through the computer system and through the other technology that we're using. So that's something to just think about. So these forms are not being collected anymore, um, and we're being able to keep track of those whereabouts and, and the calls for service through other means. I guess the, the other comment I had was that I went on Google, Google and did a little map and drew out the, the traffic, and it's pretty obvious that, you know, the, that the individual just pulled in, the sweats was closed during the pandemic, and pulled around to the gas station, and the, the, pretty clearly it was a pretext stop, and so I, I support the director's findings on that. The only question I have, and uh, obviously the director's recommended the minimum suspension on that, but I just have a little bit of a philosophical problem with just the delay. We were 19 months after it happened that we come out with recommendations. It, my own preference probably would be to to recommend uh, a suspension of uh, maybe something like four days. It just just simply because of the passage of time on it, which is not the officer's fault. It's and it's not necessarily our fault, but it just happened. That, but it pretty clearly was a pre pretextual stop. There's just no basis for that. Uh, uh, I'm sure we've all pulled through a restaurant that was closed and pulled back out. Uh, and the problem of, I'm not sure why they would direct the individual to turn the motor off and, and roll up the windows. Maybe Commander could speak to that, but that on an 86 degree day, that does seem a little abusive. And I, I don't, I, I would say I'm not in a position to answer any of these questions because I wasn't part of that investigation. Yeah. And so I, there's very specific things in that investigation that I can't comment on because I don't have it in front of me and I wasn't part of it. If there's anything specific that you'd like me to find out, I can definitely get that information yeah, I was just to curious, you, sir. Is there a policy when you've got a car stopped to have it motor turned off? I can see some reasons why you might want to do it to prevent a sudden departure or, but rolling up the windows, uh, with the motor off uh, on a hot day does seem a bit of a bit of a problem. I was just curious if, if there was a reason for that policy. Uh, there is no policy that I know of that says that. Um, uh, but I don't, I, again, I don't know why the officer, if he did do that, why he did that. That's something that I wouldn't be able to speak on. Sure. So, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Kamaguchi. Yeah, if I can speak to my experience of being told to roll up my windows after an officer asked for me to take my keys out of the ignition and then took the keys out of my hand, the, the thing that was told to me is to prevent me from throwing anything out of the window. Uh, and I'm just talking about my experience. I'm not saying that this has been here. But also, I wanted to ask uh, Executive Director uh, Fitcher, um, why, or just like the thinking behind going Category B eight days? which was the recommended discipline for the office. Oh yeah, I decided to go with that because I looked at what the, um, the officer's disciplinary record in the past, and I also took in note the time frame of where we were. Um, and, and I think that there, you know, 19 months is a long time, but it, there still needed to be some discipline because what happened was OPA didn't discipline the officer for the same exact thing. They gave the, um, the officer a one-day suspension um, for the voiding of the ticket, but not necessarily for the obstruction. And so the other thing I wanted to bring up, and I think that Mr. Goddard highlighted that, and that is, you know, maybe what we need to do, um, I think is a really valid point, and that is to ask that MMPD stay their um, investigations or complaints, you know, in, once we make the notification going forward. We won't be able to do it on these old ones, but going forward as we have cases that before they make a discipline um, determination that um, they would hold off until we make ours first. I hope that answered your question. It does, and if, if that doesn't, if there's no more questions from the board, I have a motion to accept, unless there's. Mr. Holloway. Um, I think um, what they decided is a good suggestion in the first place. That's a breakdown in OPA. They need to clean house. They're talking about one day and then some other things has, as you uh, continue the investigation file and find that some other thing has been violated. So uh, to keep down lawsuits, 
we need to act accordingly and follow every procedure that we can because people are real sensitive these days and they are going to their attorneys and uh, and a lot of these we got more attorneys than we have uh, clients in this in this uh, city and so they're looking for something to a file suit again so it's important that we dot all the and cross all the T's and it's important for our officer to be professional Thank you, Mr. Holloway. Um, Mr. Kamaguchi, do you want to move? To yeah, I have a motion to accept um, the accept the proposed resolution report. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Abdullah. Any focused discussion on the motion? If not, all in favor of accepting the recommendations, say aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, Judge Brown. So the motion passes. Next, I think, yeah, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had another thought on that conversation, and I didn't want it to get in the way of the transaction. But the general question that I think Member Brown does bring up is we realize that we are dealing with, we have been doing PRRs on cases that have been around for a while. Now, the issue of the delay and the work through the backlog, and I was trying to check my calendar real quickly. When did we start doing this in earnest? Was it August of this month? We had, there was one of our meetings where we recommended that we have a committee to look at that, and I see heads nodding of persons who were there. Was that August when that happened? Right, so um, Director Fitcher, do you think that we are, are we making progress? Have we sort of accelerated enough to clear the back load? How close are we to having PRRs that are in shorter time within six months or less of the alleged offense? Yeah, I think we've cleaned out 2020. And so we have already received 2021. I think we have four pending right now that um, Attorney Yoon is working on um, that was sent in the last few weeks. Um, I think that we can clear out our 2021 backlog, hopefully by before the spring is up. Um, I, I'm, you know, if we can, I do think that we would have to have maybe one or two additional um, uh, meetings to just accelerate that process um, because we can get them done. But if we have a lot of things on the agenda, it, you know, in in conjunction with the PRRs, it may just expand our time. But if we can have a couple special meetings, I think that we could clear 2021 up before June. So um, that would be very helpful. To so me. I'm thinking out loud. I don't know if this is going to ripen into a motion, but I would like to sort of take the temperature of the board to see how you all would feel about going ahead and calendaring at least one special meeting in January. Mm -hmm. And maybe not two, but if we have to double up and meet once every two weeks, so two meetings in January, a special and a regular, and then in February, a special and a regular, because for the members who are rolling off mm -hmm. and we don't know what the future holds, are you all gone before the February meeting? Yep. Yep. Are you gone at the end of the January meeting? Let yep. me ask that. Okay. That is if they don't fill the position. Right, right, right. Do you see where I'm going? And I kind of, I like this team. I mean, I like what we're able to do together. Uh, would you please, and this is a terrible thing because we're going into the holiday break, take a look at the pending list at Attorney Yoon's progress. And we've already rec sort of demonstrated the ability that when we, you know, mm -hmm. hydrate well before we come in here, we can knock out three <laughs> in a meeting. You know, let's see if a stretch goal of getting seven done in January, let me put it that way. And maybe you can look to see which ones are easier or hard, right? So if you take them a little bit out of order to accommodate that, if our stretch goal can be that we're going to accomplish seven PRRs by the close of January. My recommendation as we are looking at metrics and evaluating ourselves 
then let's plan at that January meeting to have a report, so Dr. Valier, you could probably already have this figured out, of the list of cases that are pending, what the length of time is from the complaint to where we will be on February 1st. And then let's sit and monitor ourselves as well. Because we want, to, we are about the business of doing justice. And we are, the members of law enforcement are members of our community. And if we are about community justice, then not having their things hang out too long is important. And at the same time, they cannot escape <coughs> accountability because of this. So let's compress it. Is everybody good with that? So is that a motion? So wait a minute, just for clarity, you want to have two meetings in January? You want to have a special call meeting and then have a regular board meeting? So we I might believe. be able to do more than seven. Okay, well, I mean, we'll, but, you we'll know, bring it on. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll see, but okay. But, but you, I mean, you can tell which ones are shorter and longer. Mm -hmm. yeah. We now, we didn't have any experience, but we know which ones you can, and if necessary, you need to go back and do the research of the prior meetings. Where do we bog down? This is one that had multiple officers involved, but it didn't seem to be that complex, right? Mm -hmm. Figure out what's a reasonable workload for us mm -hmm. to get done in one meeting, and then look at what it takes for two. So I think, I'm getting ready to make a motion that we move, that this board will agree to convene twice in public session in the month of January with the second special called meeting for the express purpose of handling backlog. Can I second that? Well, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> Motion is we move to agree to two meetings, and that includes a special called meeting with special emphasis on PRRs, and that we're asking the research staff to prepare a list, so assuming that the ones that are calendared in January are disposed of, what would the remaining list, effective February 1st, we need to have an aging report of the number of cases and the length of time they've been in the hopper, so that in the January meeting, we can determine whether or not we need to make another motion to do additional work and we'll, we'll also have a better sense of, this is editorial, because we'll know who we have on the board. And if we need to slow down, because we need to get new members up and going, we can address that. So the motion is special meeting in January for PRRs, that we will do PRRs at both the special meeting and the general, and that staff will let us know what the starting February 1st, what the aging report is and we can report to all of our constituencies how we're doing with closing that gap. That's the motion. Boom. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Judge Brown. Keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, we actually had adopted a procedure where we would have a report on any cases pending more than six months, and the reason I, I didn't see that this time. Uh, so we should... We should have been getting that, and my only question about the January meeting, because uh, I think it certainly should be done if we can get them, I'd, but there would be no reason to call a meeting if we've only got one or maybe one or two reports because we could handle them in a regular meeting. But if we've got more than that, I clearly agree we should have, uh, have a meeting. Uh, well, let's be in discussion for a moment. What do we as a board think? A reasonable lag time is so are we current if we're within three months of complaint to PRR is it two months what what well, do we what do we think is caught up because I I don't know that I know the answer to that we had already adopted a procedure to get a report on any cases that were yes been pending more than six months yes we had that pending more than six months but I'm asking a slightly different question what do we consider caught up what is the length of time in which we're saying this is current? Do you follow what I'm saying? Because if three months is it, then Member Brown's correct. We look at that report of six, and anything over three months is overdue, and that would be the subject of a catch-up meeting. So what do, we, what do we think is 
the outer limits of a current case. Mr. Abdullah. I guess the question that I would have is, how fast does the police department, um, yeah, what is it called, OPA? Yeah, how fast do they move? Because that, that would kind of answer that question, in my mind, if, if they're moving at a rate and we're still playing catch up, then it, it doesn't work because we would still have the same problem. So, well, they, but that's assuming that member Goddard's proposed rule kicks mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. that they slow down and let us have first bite, right? So mm -hmm. if we do that, then we still get into, well, how long is too long? Well, remember, OPA has eight investigators, and they have a 45-day room, right? And so they have eight, but they also, they have, or they may have even more than eight. I know they have eight working there, but they have spots for 11. So, you know, they have sergeants that come and go. New sergeants are working, you know, in, in OPA as well. Um, another holdup is the cases which are going to have to start asking the district attorney to release these TBI cases so that we can get our audits done. Because we have, um, it looks like we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten force reviews, or those are involving either some type of um, excessive force or some type of deadly shootings or shootings. And so we need to get those done. Um, and we have, I know for certain we have one that will be ready for you in January, but we, you know, I don't know if we would have time to get more than one of those done, maybe two, I don't know for certain. But my point is that the district attorney is, it will have to give us those, that information so that we can bring these before you too, because I think that these are very important cases that need to be heard by this board. Um, you know, um, because they've been pending. So these are all 2021 cases, and we know that there's been, what, 10, 10 police shootings? So, yeah. so I would offer this just as a discussion clarification. I don't think it changes the motion. Okay. That the motion is that we have a second meeting to work towards backlog, and that the agenda for that meeting be as long as you think we can reasonably operate in two hours, what we think is a normal linked COB meeting okay. for those of you all that weren't around in the beginning um, right? right and we have the list that member Brown has reminded us of so we can look to see where we are but what I am going to then ask maybe staff to do is at that called meeting give us more of a sense of what you think the flow of work is with the force reviews and the others that you're talking about because at that meeting, I do think that we need to hone in on the question of what we, of when we say we're caught up. There is always going to be a, a, a buffer, but we need to decide what a legitimate buffer is so that we know when we're falling behind that, so we take corrective action of more meetings, more help, et cetera. And I'm also going to say that that buffer definition helps us get into that budget Correct. headspace that we need to be. Mm -hmm. That is exactly p the kind of data that we were looking for that we weren't able to give then. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I'm good with the motion, but I think you hear we need to have this, what is the buffer mm -hmm. next month? Mr. Holloway. Um, I can agree having an additional meeting to kind of speed up the process, providing we get the right information reasonable amount of time, but we still got to keep in mind everybody, whether they're right or wrong, is entitled to due process. Mr. Wynn? Yeah, Dr. I, I agree. We need to get to work. Let, let's, I, I, we need to get to work. Let, let's, let's get these out of the way. Um, my question to the director is when a OPA makes a decision on punishment and the chief administers the punishment, is that punishment already over with by the time we get the reports to review on our recommendation for the punishment? Most times, yes. Most times, yes, because with the uh, force review, I've been going to these force review hearings, right, and making, and, and those have already, um, officers have, they have already made their determination. Um, and we still, until, it's at that moment that I'm been getting the information, right, because they give it to me 
They're supposed to give it to me according to the policy five days before the, the force review board hearing, but I've been getting it like a day or so beforehand. So I review it. But at that point, um, that's when we get all the information. Now, it could be because our, when you think about some of it, our investigators have, you know, most of them have six, seven, ten cases each um, that they're still trying to work through. But, of course, um, yeah, so you, to your question, yes, they've already went through their process. And you and you requested for the department to hold up on punishment until we review the cases. Is that no? We haven't done that yet. That's just something that we just decided to talk about um, in our executive committee meeting. So uh, there was a request for that that Chair Martinez sent to the chief a few days ago. Right. Well, last week, I think last week. You want to go? Ahead, come on. Sir, I'm sorry. I think there's a might be a little bit of confusion. OPA doesn't. Uh, do the disciplinary portion of this. OPA specifically investigates, and once they come up with their findings, they send it back up to the chain of command of whoever the officer is, and through the chain, that's where they come up with the disciplinary action. So it's not actually OPA that's coming up with discipline. They are strictly there to uh, investigate. Once they investigate it and they come up with their findings, they will send the, the investigation back to the command staff of wherever the officer is, and they will figure that out. So I just want to make sure that there's not a confusion on there. And then they make the recommendation to the chief about the punishment. Yes, the chain of command, that officer's chain of command will make the recommendation, and then they will go up to the chief uh, for the chief's decision. Is on that, that a pretty quick process? It just depends. I, I, I would say it just depends on different factors. Uh, some are a little faster than others, but uh, again, it, it goes through the, the chain of command first. So. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Try to clarify what I think happened in the letter. If we haven't received a complaint and there's an OPA investigation that goes to the chief, that's the only recommendation he's going to get. So he acts on that. We're saying if we advise the police department that we have received in our investigating complaint, the chief then knows he's going to get two recommendations, one from OPA if they're doing an investigation and one from us, and ask you that he wait until he has both before making a decision. Now, incumbent on us, not stated in the letter, but I think incumbent on us is to do that reasonably promptly not breakneck speed and haste makes waste, but not be 19 months or so when right. we, we've been, I know all the issues with that, and right. avoid that going forward. Thank you. And I'm just going to read that part into the record so that what Chair Martinez asked, his, his, his request was, lastly, to avoid this issue in future responses to proposed resolution reports, the board requests the MMPD stay its disciplinary proceedings until or simultaneous with the COB's resolution report and vice versa. If the MMPD continues to issue disciplinary sanctions ahead of the COB's findings, it will interfere directly with the board's ability to recommend discipline as described in the Metro Charter. And that was the request. Mr. Kemmelgooch. Yeah, I think um, as far as just like a buffer, um, I think with the number of staff that we have, the number of investigators that we have, and the uptick of, of complaints, I think three to six months makes sense, especially when um, there's an issue with getting records or there's having to be cross-body coordination and things like that. Um, but I do think that number can be reduced as we go into possibly hiring more investigators. Um, and I just wanted to directly answer your question, Dr. Hill. Thank you for that answer. Uh, the strategic concern is if we answer the question in terms of the optimal, what's appropriate, then that by, drives a budget consideration. Right. If we say we can live with six months, there's no pressure to hire more. Right. So I, I, and again, I'm deferring the answer to the question to the next meeting. But I think we really ought to think about what's optimal for all of this. Because if OPA has something and it's sitting here, the officer is fitting it, figuring out how to fix his or her life in according to what's coming up, we need, that is a very compelling budget argument yep. for bringing us up to parity. Yep. So we create the pressure when we say if it's there, our, we should be able to meet 45 days just as they are. Yep. And if we're not able to do that, we are under-resourced. Right. Mm -hmm. So, thanks. Was there a second to the motion? Thank you, Ms. McCree. I need more focused discussion on the motion. If not, all in favor say aye. 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 
Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Um, next, we have public comment. I don't know if anyone has signed up for public comment this evening. If not, we can move on to new business or announcements. New business and announcements. And if there is, oh, Mr. Wynn. Yeah, I do. Um, if I don't get a chance to see you all in the next year, happy holidays, one. And, and second, it's been a pleasure working with all of you all who are going off the board. Um, I've, I've learned a lot. I'm not where I want to be yet, but it's been a pleasure working with you and watching your honest and thoughtful and, you know, careful analysis of something that's really, really, really important to our city, which is the, you know, safe administration of justice from our police department. So I, it's been an honor working with all of you. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. Any other, Director Fitcher? I just wanted to say that we had graduates from the Citizens Police Academy. They received their certificates today. So we have, I want to say, four staff members and um, Mr. Wynn. And so um, if you haven't um, taken um, a part of the um, Citizens Police Academy, then make sure you get with me so that I can get you um, into the next class um, as required by state law. <laughs> so, Thank you, Director Fitcher. Mm -hmm. Mr. Holloway. Well, it sounded like it was the end of the road for the folks going out of the board, but it's not. Who knows may ha what may happen before the council? And yeah. our last meeting would be in January. Do yeah. I? Our last meeting would be in January. Yeah. Lord of beer. Mr. Campbell Gooch. Yeah, with that being said, I just wanted to mention real fast, and I didn't want to end this meeting since this is our last meeting without mentioning that this year, um, and I think this was mentioned earlier, that we had 10 people that were in an incident where a police officer shot them. And I think we all can agree that one is too many. So although this is the last um, meeting of the year, I just wanted to mention, I think next year we're gonna need an extreme intervention to make sure our folks that are in our communities and our folks that we hold precious and dear that got us to this board are not continuously being harmed. With that being said, I wanted to note that my cousin Rod Reed was shot by an MMPD officer a few weeks ago, and I will be recusing myself from any investigation or complaint that may come about of this. But I wanted to make sure and hold that our communities have experienced an abnormal amount of violence this year. And I think as board members, as we go on this holiday break, I think it is very compelling to think about what type of intervention this board can make next year so we do not end up in the same situation um, that we were in this year. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. If there's no other new business or announcements, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Judge Brown. Thank you, Mr. Campbell Gooch. Uh, all in favor of adjourning the meeting, say aye. aye. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.